Good morning. Great to see you all here today. Great to be here with you. We have some announcements that we're going to share with you and begin with Wayne, who has an announcement he wants to share. like that. Fifty dollars, thirty dollars, even nineteen ninety-five plus shipping and handling. <laughs> no, it's free. If you'd like to hear more great singing like that, we have a chance here at Fort Hill at the fall kickoff brunch on September the 16th. This is an a cappella group from the Stanton Waynesboro area. Some of you may remember the group from three years ago when they were here at Fort Hill. The brunch will be held on Saturday, September the 16th, 10 a.m. at the Fellowship Hall. Be sure to bring a breakfast food to share. You know how we all love to eat. I know I do. You know, I've discovered something, though. The older I get, the tougher it is to lose weight. It seems my body and my fat have gotten to be really good friends. So don't forget, Fall kickoff brunch, Saturday, September the 16th at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Food, fun, fellowship, and great entertainment. Be sure to RSVP to the church office by next Sunday, September the 10th. Hope to see you there. Thank you, Wayne. Dee has an announcement regarding Kingdom's Kids. Good morning. <laughs> Friends, we are entering our fifth year of Kingdom Kids Ministry. Doesn't seem possible. They say time flies when you're having fun. That must be it. Kingdom Kids is fun. <laughs> Next week we start fall session. Do you have your flyer in your bulletin? Notice that our times are the same, girls and boys which is 4 o'clock on the playground, and then we come inside for Bible adventures, growing together, and music, plus a free snack supper, and you're done at 6.15. What's new in Kingdom Kids this year? In addition to newly decorated and arranged rooms on third floor, we are presenting a new Growing in Grace curriculum that is faith-based. The heart of the curriculum is music, from which a treasure trove of growing together games, learning activities, and Bible-based experiences are derived. All elements of Growing in Grace are founded on developmentally appropriate musical elements, and most importantly, the faith concepts. Also new this fall is that, well, Kingdom Kids is only three sessions long this fall. That's right, we end with a bang. I mean a picnic for all children, families, and volunteers outside near the playground. All food is provided so you can enjoy the fun. Then, after a few weeks, we start October the 22nd for winter session, which will be leading us into a Christmas program in December. But wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll hear more about that later. The third new thing is that Kingdom Kids children will have a mission project this fall. Although it's a surprise right now, I can say it is related to our theme, All Creation Sings. We expect to see many familiar faces on September the 10th. We are looking for new faces to join us, so don't miss out. Come to Kingdom Kids and start your week with God's love in your heart. Thanks to all who are volunteering to lead our children, we always need more help, no matter how much or how little time you are available. See Gene Fielding or me anytime to explore this opportunity. Keep your flyer handy to remind you to come 
and there are registration forms in the Welcome Center and on the playground if you want to fill out in advance and bring with you next Sunday. But it's okay to do it all when you check in. Just come, boys and girls. You are invited. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dee. Good things are happening in that ministry. New things are happening in that ministry as well, as you heard. You have this in your bulletin in regards to UMCOR and their response to the devastation in the Texas, South Texas. You have many opportunities that you can participate. I want to bring up the third one, it's the contributions. You can do one of two things. You can go directly to um, advance or to the UMCOR website, Disaster Relief Response Advance 9016. Seven zero, and you can make a donation there or you can give a donation to the church and designate it for this and we will send it in. So I want to bring that up for those of you who wish to give financial assistance. You will be hearing more opportunities that we have more hands-on operations as time goes by and we hear more. Of course, you can look for the Gleaning for the World truck that is gathered in various locations receiving supplies that they're shipping down immediately. So those are just three opportunities that we will try to make available that we can help out in this crisis in Texas. Are there any announcements that need to come up at this time? Yes. Thank you, Danny. Immediately following the worship service this morning, there will be a time of gathering in the fellowship hall. The Desires are going to be celebrating Benjamin's first birthday, and everyone in the church is invited to come down and participate and be part of that. The food is being provided by them, so you need to bring nothing but the fellowship and the time there. That will be downstairs in our fellowship hall immediately following the worship service. Anything else? Yes. Thank you, Patty. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there are no other announcements, let us take this time to pray for the morning worship, and we can pray. Thank you.
Let us stand for the morning invocation. And let us pray together. O oh God of everyone, we come before you this morning, knowing you call us into the work of your kingdom, into the ministry of Jesus Christ. We are called to go where you send us, even when that means reaching out to those we do not know, for you know them. For you are the God of the saved and the unsaved, the good and the bad, the strong and the weak, the rich and the poor, the God of every person, every color, every race, every station. You are the God of all peoples and of every nation. Therefore, give us grace and courage to be your servants, called into the work of your kingdom, for your glory and for the good of your people everywhere. Amen.
today comes from Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must try to sign and look at this great sight. See why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses! Moses! Here I am! Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land a land of flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. If, if I go to the Israelites and say to them that the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name, what shall I say to them? I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of God for the people of God.
And let us go to Lord in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, anoint me with your spirit, that as I speak, may it be you who speak through me, and open all our hearts and minds to receive your word, that we may grow in it. And by it, O God, may we seek to serve you and glorify you in all things. For this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The story of Moses being called by God is actually a very familiar one because, believe it or not, it's one that you and I encounter just about every day. But the reason why we don't recognize it is because, well, let's face it, when was the last time God showed up in a burning bush? The simple reality is, is that when God comes knocking, when God comes calling, when God comes to get our attention, he's going to use things that actually are very commonplace. What we have to learn to do as believers, as followers, as disciples of Christ, is to be open and attentive to when God shows up so that we will recognize him and that we will listen to his message. The first slide gives us a little bit of an idea as to what this looks like. When we're looking for God, let's face it, God doesn't look like what we expect. For example, well, they'll get to it here in a minute. There it is. God doesn't look like that. At least, I don't think he does. But what we're often looking for is something that befits what we think God would look like. I chose that picture particularly because at least it was not uh, scary. I chose another one which was a lot more frightening because I was going for the awesomeness of God, but then I thought, nah, throw that one out because that's really not what we want to encounter. So I thought I'd go with a pleasant one. That's a God I could sit down and talk to. He's an impish grin, kind of looks like a little fun, maybe a little mischievous. I can deal with a God like that. But that's not how God comes to me. And I don't know what God looks like, but I don't think that's it. Here's what God looked like for Moses. A burning bush. Now, if God would come to me in a burning bush that was not being consumed, I might very well pay attention, particularly if it's in my own backyard, such as it was with Moses keeping the sheep. I'd want to look aside and see this thing that, that is happening and wonder why the bush isn't being consumed and so forth, just like Moses. But it wasn't the burning bush that got his attention so readily that called him out of his comfortable existence. It was the voice of God. Here's the problem. We can see all the burning bushes we want, but if we don't hear the message, what good is it? The next slide helps us even understand God a little bit better. Elijah went up on a mountain. Now, Elijah was at a low point in his life. He had done great things with God, and God had done great things through him. He knew God, and God had used him. So if anybody should have had great faith, it was Elijah, but he was at a low ebb. He was at a very low point, and he was running from those who were trying to kill him, and he was scared for his life, and he whines to God, you know, they've killed all the prophets, only I am left, and so forth. And God sends him up on the mountaintop with the idea that he's going to come to him. And the first thing that happens, there's this great wind. That's that upper left-hand picture there that rent the mountain. Only it says that God wasn't in the wind. Then there was this great earthquake. That's that bottom one there. That rent the mountain, shook it. Well, you know, if you gave me an earthquake, I'd pay attention. I remember the earthquake we had out at Lake Anna that time, and I walked outside thinking a huge helicopter was flying over the house, only to find out that the ground was rumbling underneath of me. I, God had my attention. But it goes on to say, God wasn't in the earthquake. Then there was this gigantic, consuming fire that took over the mountain. Only it said again that God wasn't in the fire. 
I think that begins to describe for us what our problem is when it comes to God. We constantly look for God in great and magnificent things, don't we? And when God doesn't show up like a Super Bowl, he doesn't get our attention. Here's how he showed up to Elijah. The next slide. A still, small voice, a whisper. That's when God gets me. Over the years, I have learned to listen for that still, small voice of God. I've learned that God isn't going to come to me like my father did, loud and yelling. God isn't going to come to me like my third grade teacher who sent me to the principal who pulled out this large paddle out of her drawer to make sure that I learned what it meant to obey. I only made one trip like that to the principal's office. I never made another one. I learned, I'm a quick study. God didn't come like that. God didn't come and all the critics and everybody who made me feel bad about myself. God didn't come in any of those, and none of those people were God's spokespersons. What got me was that in the middle of the night, after I had been reading the scriptures, and I want to make that clear, after I had been reading the scriptures, suddenly I could hear God speak to me. Now, it wasn't like Moses and, you know, Cecil B. DeMille's film. It wasn't like Charlton Heston up there. But what happened was God brought to my mind that one little verse of scripture that suddenly got my attention, and it was very quiet. And if I had been thinking, and if I had been focusing on so many other things, I guarantee you I'd have missed it. But I didn't. I heard that still, small voice. James Thomas is a colleague of mine, and he preached on this when we were just young pastors in the conference. And he talked about this, and I was excited by what he did. He was talking about all the ways that Elijah was looking for God, and God didn't show up. And then he said, God showed up in a still, small voice, and Elijah went forward in the mountain, covering his face. And then he said this, what did the voice say? You see, that's what we need to learn. We need to learn how to listen, how to pay attention to God. One of the problems that we have in church in America today is what has happened is, is we've gotten very good at going to church. We've gotten very good at playing Christian. We've not gotten good at being Christian. Because in order to be Christian, you've got to hear God, and you've got to obey God. But we go to church, we sit in the pew, we endure the sermon and the worship service, we go home and say, what would you do today? Well, we went to church. Well, what happened? I don't know. They sang hymns, and the guy got up and talked for a while. <laughs> Hopefully here at Fort Hill, you're getting a little bit more than that. When you go home, you can say, well, what did you do at church today? Well, the pastor got up and looked like Moses. Oh, I want to come to your church. Something new, something different, something that wakes us up, something that makes worship an experience of God. That's what should be happening. And hopefully that's what Janet and I and, and some others in this church are, are trying to make happen. And by the way, while I'm at it, let me give you a little commercial. You're invited to join in that. You're invited to come along and become part of it. And you can, be, you can be involved. You don't have to just come and sit in the pew and endure it. You can come up and get involved. Because that's exactly what God in worship is trying to get us to hear. How we can get involved. This morning during the time of announcements, you heard three, four opportunities where we can get involved. You heard about the brunch. We can come out. And we can gather together for fun, food, fellowship, and entertainment. And we can gather in Christian fellowship and enjoy that. That's one way. And you're good at that. And that's good. That's a good thing. 
But then Kingdom Kids is going to start up in the next week, and they're going to have this little abbreviated three-week session that's going to reach out to children in our community, and that's a great ministry. It's one of the best ministries we got going on here. And there's another opportunity God is calling you to get involved. Then there's the announcement regarding UMCOR. To reach out to people we don't know but we've heard about. And the devastation we've been watching and shaking our heads and praying about and grieving over and, and, and seeking to find some way to where God is present. Well, now we know how God is going to be present. He's going to be present through all the rest of us who weren't directly affected by Harvey but now want to reach out to those who were. So there's a third way God is calling us to get involved. And then there's a fourth way, and Patty was bringing it. It's about a women's conference that's going to happen in November. That's an opportunity to step aside, to step out of your usual routine and go away with one purpose in mind, to actually open yourself to just be with God and others with God. And to do that in a way that will encourage you and increase your faith and strengthen you in your beliefs and in your practice and in your life. There's four ways you heard this morning, just during the time of announcements, that God is calling you and inviting you and seeking for you to get involved. You see, if we look at only at the story of Moses as this wonderful event of a burning bush and, and God hearing Moses, we're going to miss it. Now, I need to honestly tell you that the story doesn't stop there. That's where the election stopped, but the story doesn't stop there. What follows is where humanity doesn't shine. The conversation between God and Moses continued, and in the conversation, Moses keeps giving God all his excuses as to why he shouldn't be the guy who should go down to see Pharaoh. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If I were in Moses' day, and I'd already been down there, and I'm already a fugitive from justice, that's the last place I want to go back to. Okay? That's the last place I want to go back. So I can understand Moses' reluctance. But he keeps giving God all these excuses, and God keeps telling him and showing him and demonstrating to him, I'm going to be with you. Everything's going to be fine. Now let me ask you. In your life, how many times have you read in the upper room or some other devotion, or just maybe reading scripture, and you get this message from God that God is with you, and yet you still continue to wrestle with worry? Anybody in here have that problem? Anybody got any worries you're dealing with? Look at y'all looking around at each other. Isn't that funny? Everybody's waiting for see who's going to be the one who raised their hand. Oh, come on. Y'all got worries. You know it. <laughs> That's great. Everybody's got worries. We've all got worries. Just ask somebody, how are you doing? I was telling my wife on the way in this morning. I said, you know, that phrase bothers me. Because a lot of times when somebody asks you, how are you doing, that's the last thing they really want to know. Because if there's anything human beings are prone to do is to begin to air their dirty laundry about what they got on their mind and what's going on in their life. And for some of us, that's the last thing we really want to know about. Particularly if the person we're asking is a chronic complainer. So the reality is, is that we all have trust issues when it comes to God. We've all got trust issues when we come to God. But here's why I think we have those trust issues. We have those trust issues because in truth, we have a difficult time really believing God's going to come through. The next slide, I think, gives it very well, says it. You may have trouble seeing it, so I'm going to read it to you. It says, we can only hear God's voice once we quiet the noise around us. Have you ever noticed that? How much the noise around us shuts out the voice of God? Boy, I know that. I know that hugely. Because one of the things that I wrestle with, one of the things that I really wrestle with in my life 
are those nagging problems that just come cropping up out of nowhere. The water heater goes. The car breaks down. I get an unexpected bill in the mail. I go to the doctor's office, and, and the doctor says, well, we need to run a test. Or we need to do more blood work. I love it when he says that. Or the kids call, and they've got a problem. And I can't fix it. And I'm standing there on the other end of the phone going, um, what are you going to do about this? Have you called so-and-so? Have you done this? Have you done that? You know, that's a parent's worst nightmare, is when your children become adults. You know, when they're under your roof, you can kind of lay down the law. But once they move out and they get on their own, suddenly you've got to start cutting those apron strings, and that's a very hard process on both sides. Because of all this, we are surrounded by noise. Noise and worries and anxieties and problems. All you got to do is pick up the newspaper. All you got to do is turn on the news. All you got to do is turn, go on Facebook. And we are inundated with it. And it's coming at us from all around. Throughout all of this, I've begun to ask myself this one question. Okay, God, where are you? Where are you, God? Where are you? And what I've learned is, is that I can't hear God's response as long as I continue to listen to the noise. I've got to shut down the noise and start focusing on God. Now, there's another problem here. Just knowing God's presence and just feeling God's presence is only one part of it. Remember I said in the very beginning, you've got to hear what God's telling you. Believe me when I stand up here and tell you, and I do not say this except humbly. That's one of the most difficult things for us to do. Because God is always concerned about things that go beyond ourselves. And what we tend to focus on is everything that's about ourselves. Most people's prayers are all about what's in their little circle of the universe. And because that's true, most people are only concerned out of what God can do for them or their family or their loved ones. But God is always asking us to expand that universe, expand that vision, expand that understanding, so that we become aware of those who are in bondage around us that God wants to liberate. That's the message that we need to draw from t for today's message for Moses. Moses wasn't asked to just trust in God. Just, hey, just have faith in me, Moses. Just, just believe I'm going to be there for you. That wasn't the message. The message is I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to liberate my people. Can you just imagine how Moses felt? If I had been Moses at that point, there wouldn't have been enough omeprazole, which, by the way, is what I take to control my stomach acid to help give me some relief. I could have swallowed Tums by the case full, and it wouldn't have given me any relief. Because the reality is, is that once God starts calling me to do something for somebody else, the first thing goes through my mind is, what if I fail? What if I fail? Every Sunday morning when I get ready to get up here and preach, this is why I take a Meprazole. I get nervous. I get very nervous. Because I want to do right by God. I want to glorify God in getting up here. And I'm always afraid that a little too much of Ron is going to break into the sermon. And God's going to get lost. And that attitude, that understanding nags at me. Can you imagine if God gave me something even greater to do? So when I stand up here and tell you this, I'm not telling you this as somebody preaching down to you. I'm telling you as somebody who shares your walk, who shares your frustration, who shares your angst. Following God isn't easy, but here's the powerful thing. God doesn't call those who are worthy. 
He equips those he calls and makes them worthy. If there's anything I've learned after all these years in the ministry is that's true. God equips us to do that which we can't believe we can do. The question is, is are we willing to try? Are we willing to try? Dallas Willard had this to say. The next slide shows you, but I doubt if you can read it, so I'm going to read it for you. Why should God speak to me? What am I doing in life that would make speaking to me a reasonable thing for him to do? Are we together in business in life? Or am I in business just for myself, trying to use a little God to advance my projects? Ouch. Simple reality is most of us, most of us, don't listen to God. We don't hear God. We don't hear what God is saying because we can't get out of that tight circle of our own context of the universe. It's a wonderful thing when we watch people like Mother Teresa who go to Calcutta and do the ministry that she did. And the danger we have is, is we all think that we should be Mother Teresa. How many Mother Teresas do we have in here this morning? Anybody? Don't look at me. You see, the reality is, is that there are those individuals, there are those individuals in life who do grand and glorious things for the glory of God. And they are true prophets, they are true ministers, they are true saints of the faith. But God's not asking us all to do that. He's asking us to do just one thing. What person in bondage around you can you help? Who can you help liberate? What one person? Maybe it's through Parkview. Maybe you can go down and help out at Parkview. Maybe you can help out Salvation Army. Maybe you can help one person who's a part of our fold here at the church who needs relief, who needs to be set free from something that's keeping them back. Maybe they need transportation. Maybe need somebody just to come and help them take care of a task in their home. What one place, what one situation can you reach out and touch? What one situation is God calling you to make a difference in? And if you can't physically do it, can you send a card? Can you make a phone call? Can you reach out to at least let that person know, hey, I'm thinking about you. You're not alone. You're not alone. We all can do something. We can hear God. But we have to learn to stop thinking in grandiose ways. We've got to learn to start thinking in everyday normal ways because it's in the everyday normal ways where most people are going to be helped and most lives are going to be changed. The last slide is really the question I leave with you. God's calling. Will you answer? Thank you.
Most gracious and loving God, take these gifts and use them well, but use us as well. Help us to hear you and even more to obey you. Let us not merely pray for those, but also become the answer to the prayers they make. For this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The time in which we go to Lord in prayer, to lift up joys and concerns. What do you wish to bring before God today? All right, we will keep her in our prayers. In my prayers. Thank you. Absolutely. Daily. Throughout the day. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ian. She passed? Yes. <laughs> I know she's not here to hear it, but she passed. She's one God sent to us. Amen. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you. And we'll continue to keep you in our prayers. Thank you. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, there are many devastating things happening in our world today. There are the fires in California. There most certainly is the flood in South Texas and those who have been hugely and horribly affected by that disaster. There is a nation who ramps up its military and is breeding fear throughout Southeast Asia. There are all kinds of circumstances in people's daily lives, hunger, poverty, and need. There are those, O oh God, who are dealing with life and death issues on a daily basis. There are those who are seeking to recover from injury or illness. And some are finding it very difficult. But there are those, O oh God, for whom we celebrate. There are those who are doing better. There are those who are feeling touched. There are those who are feeling and experiencing your intervening presence and the love of others who reach out in your grace. There are many things for which we can give you praise those who have passed the bar or just are getting the opportunity in a new year, in a new school as they enter college, and those who continue in college and start a new year toward their education. There are many things, O oh God, for which we can give you thanks and praise, and sometimes we just don't do that enough. For we are always focused upon the things we need. But help us in the midst of all this, O oh God, to recognize the needs of others to recognize that's what brings us really together, that we all are in need. It's what unifies us, our need for your grace and salvation, our need for the help and assistance of others, even when we don't think it will ever befall us. Therefore, O oh God, continue to be with your children here in this, your house, 
as we endeavor to open ourselves to your presence and your power to reach out to those who are in bondage to whatever holds them back, that we, O oh God, may act as your emissary and liberator. For this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father,
Let us join together in the prayer after communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. continue our fellowship and listening to God.
Someone asked me a few weeks ago, why now do you make us sit down for the postlude? Here's why. Because we tend to rush into the world. We tend to start thinking about what's on the next thing of our agenda, what we got to get to, and usually at this point it's lunch. But it's always thinking ahead, always thinking about, and we don't pause to let God speak. And that's why sometimes we don't hear him. God's talking. But God is going to call us out of our routines, and God's going to call us out of what we normally do so that we can do something great for him, even if that something great isn't something that's grandiose, that reaches out to just one other person. But are we going to be quiet long enough? Quiet the noise, quiet the agenda, quiet the other things that we go running into long enough to hear it. Will you hear the Lord? Will you answer? Go in God's grace.